All right. Um, thank you very much, Josh, for a wonderful introduction. And um, Charles and I will now commence with a, a joint production which, where we'll sort of switch back and forth at uh, various points. So, uh, but, but before I go into that, let me welcome you all. Uh, thanks for, for coming. Thanks for making the time. And I do hope that we'll have a stimulating and uh, interesting discussion uh, in the next day and a half. So, in what is probably one of the most misquoted statements by an anthropologist, Claude Lévi-Strauss, in a 1959 radio interview, once spoke of a distinction between hot and cold societies. He later revisited and specified this distinction as a difference not between societies with or without history, but as one between societies ideologically receptive to representations of their own becoming and transformation, <clears throat> and those likely to suppress or downplay evidence of their changing condition in favor of an imaginary of timeless aboriginality propped up by what Marshall Solomons would later call the mechanism of stereotypical reproduction. Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. As J.G.A. Pocock argued around the same time, some people simply seem to ignore what he called the problems that produce historians. But what are the grounds on which such a distinction might become thinkable in the first place and experientially salient in the second? Surely, the hotness attributed, at least implicitly, to us rather than them is the product of a relatively short history in the West itself. It reaches no further back than Gibbon's melancholic musings about the decline and fall of Rome or Burke's strictures against the Jacobins' uprooting of timeless organic order. Even the most dramatic prior upheavals in the Christian West, the wars unleashed by the Reformation, presented themselves as a return to a past, pure past, of unadulterated Christian virtue. As Reinhard Koselleck argued, it was only in the 19th century that history, as a collective singular and so universal, human condition became available as an ideological template. To the degree uh, the Western present was heating up, we might say its past became cold, over and done with, so alien in ontological terms that it seemed to demand its own form of secular anamnesis. Disciplined historiography, a science of the traces the past left on the surface of the contemporary world. As contemporary Western common sense has it, this state of affairs was the result of the so-called historicist revolution of the 19th century, when history attained the status of an academic discipline devoted to just such anamnestics. True, if only to a degree. Consider here how one of the prime analyses of historicism at the point of its unquestionable triumph, that is in 1924, phrased the relation between cause and effect. <clears throat> and I'm quoting now. It is not historiography which brought us historicism, wrote Karl Mannheim. Rather, the historical process through which we have lived turned us into historicists. Such considerations led Mannheim to qualify historicism as the Weltanschauung of modernity, a highly self-conscious cultural formation suffused with a structure of feelings celebratory of its own hotness. Still, despite these crucial insights, Mannheim speaks of the historical process in agentive terms and so reveals himself to be among the believers. His was a world in which historicism's project of rationalizing social being and becoming had already left no other alternative than to attribute these changes to the historical process. Difficult as it may be to step back beyond that threshold, it isn't hard to see how Mannheim's diagnosis of a new regime of temporality dovetails with Latour's diagnosis of the modern constitution as a project of purification, productive of its own hybrids. For even among the educated bourgeoisie of the early 20th century, for whom Mannheim, of course, spoke, there were indications of uneasiness about the effects of such conceptual separations. Thus, all the while that Marx was cautioning his contemporaries to let, the dead bury the, to let the dead bury the dead and forge ahead towards a future of unalienated social being, some of them, including his buddy Fred Engels, 
were at least curious about one of historicism's illegitimate Western doubles in Nandi's sense, namely spiritualism, a however variegated mode of giving voice to historicism's ultimate subalterns, the dead. Ever since the Heightsville incidents in 1847, when a dead peddler revealed a hitherto unknown aspect of the past, namely his own murder, to the Fox sisters, the dead were no longer in need of representation. They spoke for themselves, and garrulously so. As is well known, the voices of the dead mediated through table wrappings, and later by means of photography, automatic writing, and direct voice manifestations, attracted some of the best minds of the late 19th and early 20th century. Crooks, Wallace, Galton, Conan Doyle, William James, you name them. Spiritualist seances and their print promulgation offered a way of communicating with the dead, not just through the traces their lives left on the surface of contemporary worlds, documents, objects, and other evidence for their phenomenologically inaccessible agency in the past. Rather, these media made the dead contemporaneous with the living, gave them the means to affect the here and now through their presence, and afforded them the kind of agency of producing evidence of their own existence that the newest communication media, particularly telegraphy, but also telephony and wireless radio, also afforded the living in their real-time interactions with others at a significant spatial remove. In this sense, the kind of paradoxical positivism characterizing spiritualism, especially once some of its proponents took the turn towards parapsychology around the turn of the 20th century, might arguably be seen as a running commentary on, perhaps even a critique of the rise of historicism as a kind of secularized materialist idealism. But perhaps, as with so many creatures of secular liberalism, historicism itself might be understood as the secular transformation of one's theological and spiritual approaches to the past. Charles will take over. We conceived this as a duet in, in, yeah. in the, from the very beginning. And uh, I add my thanks to the Neubauer Collegium and uh, everyone, J uh, Jamie in particular, Josh as well, for just helping facilitate this event. So carrying on from the points that Stefan has just made, Closer consideration of this matter might begin with Halbach's substantial chapter on religious collective memory, where he asserted that religions produce symbolic histories of those who practice them. The challenge to Christians, for instance, was how to preserve knowledge of Christ after living memory had vanished. Two alternative techniques for recuperating the past emerged which Halbach labeled dogmatism and mysticism, respectively. The priesthood and theologians approached the truth of Christ through intensive study of the canonical texts, while mystics held that they could sense it directly in visions, dreams, during prayer, or via other forms of personal revelation. In his own parallel formulation of Weber's charisma and routinization thesis, Halvox maintained that Christian historical consciousness derives from an ebb and flow between dogmatism and mysticism. Bouts of pious absorption followed periods of rational scholarship because it was not enough to read about Christ and know him textually and intellectually the truth needed to be re-experienced over and over. We could describe this as two types of authenticity, one philological and external, the other psychological and individual. As Halvax put it, and I quote, the mystics seek the meaning of a sacrament and not exclusively in what the church teaches but above all, in the feelings that participation in the sacrament evokes for them, as if it were then possible directly to reach the event or the sacred personage 
that the, that the sacrament commemorates. The relevance of this example for this conference it should not be difficult to see. Professional historians work in a mode comparable to scholastic theology, while Havvox's mystical dimension models the experiential relationship to history. Havvox's configuration is, however, more than just an elaborate analogy for the relationship between scholarly historiography and experiential historicizing practices. The particular, the particular Judeo-Christian heritage of Passover seders, Eucharistic communions, both of which are anamnestic rituals, these very much prepare Western sensibility about the past, producing a historically effected consciousness, to use Gadamer's <coughs> terms. Wirkungsgeschichtliches uh, Bewusstsein. Well, it's Constantine, yeah. Uh, the consciousness, whether of those who approach the past in the spirit, the consciousness, whether you're a person approaching the past in the spirit of historical disciplinary research, or someone engaging in more sensual, performative modes, the consciousness of either one of those two is already conditioned by the history such practitioners are setting themselves to describe or relive. Remember the circuit that uh, Stefan just mentioned that Mannheim identified between the lived realities of modernization and the rise of historicism as methodology. If modernity gave us historicism, then Judeo-Christianity gave us two main modes of approaching the past. One, through objectified um, rational thought, or the other through subjective identification. The knower and the known are in a moving relationship, mutually constitutive and occasionally isomorphic. The tension identified by Halbwachs thus immediately transfers over to the terms of this conference. This duality between dispassionate scholarship on the one side and subjective immersion on the other has been fundamental within professional historiography ever since Ranke's Berlin seminars in the late 1820s. Most people take Ranke's famous dictum that history is the endeavor to present the past as it actually was. They take that to be a call for increased archival research, intense, more intense uh, research in sources. The copious use of footnotes, as Grafton has shown, and, and by the way, the copious use of footnotes was partly motivated by the desire to distinguish proper historiography from historical fiction. That uh, scholarship displayed, foot, of the footnote, displayed the erudition, the factual basis, and the critical reasoning validating historians' assertions. The figure of Ranka has anchored the scholarly, this scholarly side of historiography, setting a tyrannizing research standard for practitioners to live up to, pushing them pushing historians practically to the precipice of pedantry, something which they occasionally uh, you know, react against because there's, um, there's a worry about knowing more and more about less and less and how, how that can be communicated to other people. <coughs> Yet Ranka has also been foundational for a very different trend in historical thought, and that is the hermeneutic interpretative tradition. To know the past as it really was also involves capturing the inner feel of the past, the subjective situation of past actors, and that's a feat of trans-historical understanding on the part of the contemporary historian. Ranka's historicism stressed the particularity of cultural historical worlds, each of which required understanding on its own terms, and so anticipated a radical cultural, so he anticipated a radical cultural relativism a full century before anthropology uh, really got embroiled in considering that, and which is a real instantiation <coughs> of Evans Pritchard's uh, famous statement that anthropology and history are two different disciplines which share a common methodology, and we share some very deep common methodological concerns. In the view of Ranka's pupil, Diltai, 
Ranka erred in thinking that a historian could successfully enter into the thought world of the past <coughs> because the historian's connection to the present could not be transcendent. Ranka, then, the hardcore archival historian, features as an extreme romantic within the hermeneutic tradition for his assumption that the historian could enter into an immediacy of empathy, of Einfühlung, with the past. Diltai stipulated a mediated and more critical understanding, Verstehen, of the past, an exercise in which empirical, psychological, and contextual data modified intuition. It wasn't enough just to have intuition, Anschauung. Pure empathy or intuition eliminated the self of the historian, the present subjectivity of the historian, making, thereby making understanding uncritical. Diltai was not alone trying to map out the boundary lines between disciplined diegesis and unruly mimetic enactment, let alone scholarly, inadmissible, viscerally experienced encounters with the past. His formulations were endorsed by Collingwood and further developed in the 1920s and 1930s when Collingwood spoke of reenacting the past, not through intuition, but, as Peirce might have said, abductively through the exercise of an informed and disciplined historical imagination. Consistent with Diltai's idea of understanding, Collingwood also conceived this as an awareness that one was contemplating the past as an object, from which the historian stood apart as a subject or as an agent, even in the recesses of imaginative reflection. Much as spiritualism arose as a contradictory parallel to historicist strictures against anachronism, so did extreme forms of empathy thrive, therefore, during and after the pronouncements of Diltai and Collingwood. Prime examples would be personal reactions to ancient ruins, beginning with the reports of travelers on the Grand Tour in the second half of the 18th century. Stendhal's syncope in Florence, syncope is a technical term, it's is a fainting spell, basically, in Florence, belongs to this genre, as does Freud's a disturbance of memory on the Acropolis. As Georges Poulet has argued, paramnesia, that is the experienced fusion of past and present, was actively cultivated by European intellectuals, ranging from Madame de Staël to Coleridge and Byron, de Quincey and Baudelaire, and, of course, Marcel Proust. And a little bit of opium didn't hurt uh, in the process. It's interesting how this uh, eruption of the past and this confusion of past and present paramnesia often has the effect of knocking people down. We were talking about that with uh, Mark Auslander uh, last night, about how witnesses at the Eichmann trial, when they began to testify and, reco and recover the past, you know, went into sort of delirious episodes. Mm -hmm. To, so the, the past can mean the present can be destabilizing and in fact just knock you off your feet as the Stendhal syndrome mm -hmm. suggests. The latter day creation of psychiatric nosological categories such as Jerusalem syndrome, which was first denominated in the year 2000, speaks to this <coughs> issue. Here, typically devout Christian tourists come unhinged while visiting Israel's holy sites until one day they tear up their hotel room sheets and descend, toga-clad, into the street, speaking with the voice of biblical figures. So does Stendhal syndrome, first described in 1979, and manifesting in disorientation, heart palpitations, and fainting that overcome visitors to Florence. In other words, academic historicism <coughs> has not, and perhaps cannot, neutralize other ways of experiencing the past. These other modes have not been diminished, only pathologized by it. Okay. Having considered two of historicism's alters, uh, spiritualism and paramnestic loss of self, uh, in a more dramatic sense than uh, Diltai probably could have imagined, we would like to now briefly uh, consider one final example, namely the psychometric signs proposed by the 19th century uh, geologist William Denton in 1863. Inspired by Doug, Rob, 
daguerreotypy, uh, Denton posited that events imprint traces on all kinds of matters, and that these traces can trigger vivid visual and sensory experiences, not just of such events in the minds of what he called sensitives, that is, people capable of rendering accessible to the senses, very much akin to photographic development, the past so recorded in brute matter. Happily, Denton's wife was one such sensitive, and while a good deal of the experiments he conducted with her fall in the geological realm, he also saw how the then nascent disciplines of history and archaeology might benefit from psychometric science. Such as when, in the course of experiments with a fragment of a fresco, pieces of tuft, and other specimens procured from Pompeii and Herculaneum, wrapped up in paper and placed in Mrs. Denton's hand, she psychometrically corroborated the dread and terror Pliny the Younger conveyed in his narrative of his uncle's death in AD 79. And she did so without any previous knowledge of the nature and origins of the specimen. Now, Denton's methodology involved the haptic inspection of objects, thus allowing the past to speak for itself through the consciousness and sensorium of privileged observers. His was, uh, we might say, a spectrographic approach to the past, if you will, an alternative optics even before the advent of X-rays, ultraviolet, and infrared photography. <coughs> that Mrs. Denton spoke of the remains of the dead in terms resembling the plaster casts that Giuseppe Fiore Fiorello was manufacturing of them at just the same time, revealing their bodies from, so to speak, the negatives they left in pyroclastic matter, certainly provides ground for speculations about the role of a convergence of older, low-tech impression taking with novel technologies of photographically remediating the now absent past in reshaping forms of historically affected consciousness about the past in, again, Gautama's sense. Up to this point, there have been divergences in practice regarding, for example, the iconic visualization of the past in genre painting. But the rise of seemingly indexical media such as photographic image impression and internal darkroom development of the past or the equally novel sonic evidencing of the past in Edisonian phonography now began to impinge, all this now began to impinge upon the type of cognitive processing necessary to produce textual accounts of the past. At the heart, at heart, there may well have been a competition for a monopoly over hypotyposis, that is, the ability to make a particular description so vivid as to be compelling. It's an old rhetorical trope. Contemporary uh, though he was of Walter Scott, Ranke thought historiography could and should surpass historical fiction. Whereas the latter th later thinkers, otherwise as different as Herbert Butterfield and George Lukacs, agreed on the superior effectiveness of the historical novel for the inculcation of liberal in one case and proletarian in the other historical consciousness. What was needed to carry the day was hypotyposis plus, plus an acceptable underlying set of procedures based on a true story, certainly, but also acquired through rational means, so deemed, and pieced together by logic and scholarship. Historicism claimed the high ground, but the Weltanschauung of modernity produced problems as fast as it solved it, solved them. Alternatives such as Denton's psychometry offered experience near solutions to the death of the past and found willing followers. Many more solutions have since been socially demanded and offered as new technologies and novel phenomena inspire us to think in different ways about the past. With the advent of cinematography, optics flipped around from Denton's emphasis on registration detection to the concerted visual representation of historical topics in films such as D.W. Griffith's 
Birth of a Nation, 1915, and Sergei, <coughs> Sergei Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin, 1924. Film removed historiography's cornerstone, the written word. And hypotyposis has been completely reconfigured in the age of digital, 3D, and interactive media. It strikes us that academic historians belated come into terms with the rhetorical aspects of their praxis, traceable perhaps most prominently to Hayden White, may owe a good deal to the competition that historical fiction and film posed by the middle of the 20th century. That so many films these days, for example, Argo, 42, The King's Speech, The Butler, and 12 Years a Slave, are accompanied by explicit writers advertising that they are based on a true story indicates that cinema and his history may be negotiating for space. Well, I was visiting my mother just a few days ago in Cincinnati. We watched uh, American Hustle on DVD, and that, that had a little bit at the end that said, some, some of this is true. <laughs> so it, it remains now, in the brief time left, to say a few words about the title of the conference. Varieties, well, that shouldn't pose any problems. But the term experience, as Martin Jay has shown, has been used in luxuriously diverse and often contradictory ways by many prominent recent thinkers. To some degree, William James might be our guide when he points out that experience quote, consists at all times of two parts, an objective and a subjective part. The objective part is the sum total of whatsoever at any given time we may be thinking, may be thinking of. The subjective part is the inner state in which the thinking comes to pass, unquote. This state, however, as thinkers from Marx and Durkheim to Gadamer and Foucault uh, as thinkers uh, such as those have reminded us, is by definition a social and therefore also an historical one. What seems certain is that there is no reason to exclude the activity of writing history from the realm of experience. And we think that practicing historians would or, or should be the last to disagree. Surely, the thrill of an archival find the sudden flash of inspiration that affords a novel interpretation of the evidence, the aesthetic and moral satisfaction accruing from a happy turn of phrase or an illuminating presentation, even just the sheer tactility and olfactory resonance of being in touch with remnants of the past, what Anchor Smith, what Anchor Smith calls the historical sublime, all of these form part and parcel of what is at stake in this conference. The varieties of historical experience thus run the complete spectrum, from standard historiographical research and composition to practices such as reenacting a historical scene, cooking and eating a period recipe, watching a docudrama, or dreaming of past events and personages. In sum, historical experience for us refers to the various ways in which people, on the horizon of their own historically constituted social worlds, go about imagining, mediating, and representing to themselves the past and its meanings for the present. That said, let us return to the formulation with which we began our reflections, the notion of the rise of a self-consciously event-dense modernity that threw up the unbridgeable chasm between the ontologically dead, cold past and its even more dynamic present. That Lévi-Strauss, late in his life, would have spoken of a refroidissement, re, I need Francois to pronounce it for refroidissement, a re, uh, recooling, a re, uh, refrigerating, a, a refreezing, a, a, a rechilling of Western societies in light of the late 20th century boom of interest in memory and heritage. His use of that term, his, his, his recurrence to that expression, may thus ultimately be symptomatic of a mythical narrative 
to which the great French savant himself succumbed, despite all that he had earlier said about Sartre falling into precisely this trap. As this conference aims to demonstrate, what is at issue is not such a cooling down of Western experiences, Western experiences of history that somehow, and just how, is an empirical question, that somehow render us, us moderns, more sympathetic to ontological conceptions in which, as Derrida might, have, might put it, times being out of joint presents no problem. Rather, and in terms that Latour might appreciate, it is that much as some educated Western moderns may have struggled with historicism, on an intellectual level, we have never been historicists, in the sense that Trulch, Mannheim, Halbwax, and others originally formulated the problem. Their analyses of the historicist condition had remained pegged to ethnographically unfounded programmatic pronouncements about themselves and their fellow rational moderns. Many of these, however, were and are people among whom the past lived on and continued to be experienced in ways beyond historiographical rationalization and remains still today in many quarters unbewältigt, unmastered, as the characteristic post-World War II German phrase has it. Whether and to what extent ever newer modes of not just rethinking history, but remediating the past will affect this balance is a question that ought now, ought now to guide our considerations and discussions. Thank you.